Welcome to today's Entrepreneur, a program about the entrepreneurial spirit that drives Quebec business, presented by FL Montreal, another remote edition uh, for this crisis. My name is Dan Delmar. Here with me tonight, back again, is Josh Miller. Good evening, Josh. Hello, Dan. How are you? I am surviving. There's uh, lots going on and lots of crisis to manage, but uh, that's why we're here right now. So uh, happy to get into this, happy to find some really, really direct and succinct things that entrepreneurs can actually take action on. Yeah, so a lot of areas we're going to cover again this evening. Much like last week, we're going to hit it from a few different areas. So we're going to start with the law, and that's going coming up in just a second. Later in the program, we're going to talk about the federal small business wage and uh, more tax advice there. We'll get to human resources as well. And banking, of course, with Patrick Sullivan um, uh, at the end there. So lots to do uh, on various different subjects. We're actually going to just jump right in, Josh, and welcome our first guest. Patrick Nakash is a business and commercial lawyer with Delegatus Lawyer Collective. Patrick, thanks so much for your time this evening. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And, you know, I, I, there's there's a lot of what's being discussed now, Dan, and, I, you know, I see it, hear it all the time. And this, this is the concept of force majeure and really the, the what what is unavoidable, what is a, a true crisis that we're living now. So maybe just to understand it, just so entrepreneurs understand that definition, because before you can even apply it in contracts, you really need to understand it. So maybe Patrick, you can start and just say, what exactly is a force majeure and are we actually experiencing it right now? Absolutely. Um, okay, so first off, in, in Quebec, force majeure uh, is uh, included in the civil code. So there's an actual definition for it in the civil code. There's also going to be um, a force measure clause in most contracts that's going to either add or replace the, uh, the standard civil code definition. So under the civil code, a force measure is an event that is uh, unforeseeable and irresistible. So what those two terms mean, uh, unforeseeability, is uh, it means that the parties could not have, at the time of the conclusion of the contract, foreseen the occurrence of an event. That doesn't mean necessarily that it's an event that's never occurred before, but it just means that a reasonable person wouldn't have foreseen the occurrence of that event during the term of the contract. Um, and again, like like everything legal, when you ask a lawyer, you know, what is this, what is that? It's always, it depends. We have to analyze it on a case-by-case -case basis. So uh, one example, we say, for example, a, a tornado could be a force majeure event uh, in Montreal, but not necessarily in Florida because it's the kind of things that they, they're used to dealing with. So... This is one half of the definition. The other half is uh, the irresistibility of the event, which means that it makes um, the execution of your contractual obligations impossible uh, under these circumstances. So it doesn't mean that it makes them more complicated, more expensive, more onerous. It just makes them impossible. It means you cannot actually perform your obligations. So those are the two halves of the force measure definition in the civil code. This definition can be changed or modified or uh, further defined in contract clause. And that's what you'll find in the force measure clauses where there's going to be examples of things that are specifically included uh, or specifically excluded, depending on the type of contract and the nature of, uh, of the relationship. Uh, if, we're, if we're talking about a, a military type agreement, well, you know, things like war and, and coup d'etat and things like that will not be force measure events. But uh, if you're looking at a medical type of agreement, maybe pandemics won't be, but 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 war might be. So that's one thing we have to keep into keep in mind when uh, assessing the the present crisis is, is that um, we have to look at the kind of agreement and what what who the parties are when we're assessing whether this this event is a force majeure or not. So, um, but now, now we're talking in Quebec. So yeah. this is is a, what about if because there's a, there's as we know the. The world has gotten much smaller and a lot mm -hmm. of the contracts are, you know, certainly go outside of Quebec, whether it's the rest of Canada or international. So are we talking about um, just Quebec issues or or do we have to really look at the contract and say, well, where is it defined for the contract to be exercised? Well, the first question, um, if, if, if the party, if one of the parties is in Quebec, uh, part of the issue will be dealt with uh, by the civil code. If the contract is governed by another law than the law of Quebec, then obviously you need to look at the law of that jurisdiction and see what um, what the parameters for force measure are in in that jurisdiction. So most jurisdictions will have this concept, 
uh, but it's not necessarily treated uh, the same way by their legal uh, system and by their courts. For example, in uh, in the rest of Canada, under common law, there's no um, the, the force majeure doesn't exist within the law. It's got to be provided for in a contract to exist. Whereas in Quebec, the civil code says uh, an event of force majeure can, for example, excuse one party from accomplishing his or her obligations. Uh, those are little differences, but you need to know which ones they are uh, in order to properly assess your situation under your contract in that jurisdiction. So obviously, I can only speak with uh, with a hundred percent knowledge of um, things under Quebec law. I know how it works in the rest of Canada, but again, there's always uh, you know differences and nuances and a situation like this one, which is not just a potential force majeure event for one party, but for most parties, um, adds another another layer of complexity to this question as well. And uh, I, I guess so. <laughs> You know, it's, it's interesting. That means you really have to go back to your, and it's after the fact, so it's a little late, but you really have to go back to your contracts and see what jurisdiction really applies and what's absolutely written in there. Now, absolutely. what if, what, what if, you know, there's terms and conditions as well, there's payment terms and conditions. What if you just can't fulfill those payment terms and conditions because the government has insisted that you close your business or that you have to send people home and you don't have a way to operate? Under what banner might you fall under? Well, if if we're talking about Quebec, for example, where force majeure is provided in the law, uh, even if your contract doesn't say that you can or can't um, uh, claim force majeure for an for a payment obligation, the fact that you um, that you are actually prevented from making payments due to this situation might allow you to claim force majeure in Quebec. Uh, in other jurisdictions, if, for example, in, in the rest of Canada, where force majeure doesn't exist in the law, it has to exist under the contract, um, you wouldn't be able to slide it in there if it's not specifically provided for. However, I know for, for a fact that in, in common law jurisdictions, there is another recourse uh, that can be used, which is not force majeure. It's called frustration. Uh, it's much, much more narrow than force majeure in Quebec, but it basically means that if uh, a certain unforeseen situation causes a situation of frustration, which means that the nature of the contract is so radically different after this event. You have a case of frustration. You can petition the court to uh, terminate the contract. So it's, it's a different situation and the recourses are more limited. Uh, again, this is my, my limited knowledge of this uh, concept, but you, can, you, also, you actually have uh, something to, uh, to claim to the courts, but for termination, not just to uh, excuse or defer a payment, for example, in in Quebec, uh, under force majeure, what the co- uh, what the con- uh, I'm sorry, what the code says, is that you are um, that you wouldn't necessarily have to execute a certain obligation during the time that the force majeure event lasts. It doesn't mean that you can get the contract terminated. It doesn't mean that the other party has a right to actually terminate the contract either. Maybe you do not want it to be terminated, but you just need to make uh, a specific um, exception for. Uh, for the duration of this event. Patrick Nakash is a business and commercial lawyer with Delegatus Lawyer Collective. Patrick, thanks so much for your time this evening. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Inspiring stories from outstanding business people, Dan Delmar and Josh Miller for today's Entrepreneur, presented by FL Montreal. And Josh, another special remote edition uh, to deal with crisis management issues. We're going to talk about HR and taxes a little later in the program. But for now, we're going to move on to some uh, small business subsidies and programs that could be available uh, for for businesses that are struggling right now. And it is a rough time. Uh, Josh, just today, the Quebec government, of course, announcing that Pretty much all businesses have to close unless they are an essential service, anyone with a retail front especially. So it's uh, it's going to be a difficult few weeks. No question about it. And the reality is, what, are the, what is the impact? And we're going to talk finances a little later. But in the meantime, from a tax standpoint or from a government stimulus standpoint, let's jump right in there with, uh, with Peter Moraitis uh, from FL Montreal. Hi, Joss. Hi, Dan. Thanks for joining us, Pete. Um, I know it's uh, crazy times now, and you're uh, you're spending lots of time just catching up on everything that's coming in. There's so much information that keeps flowing in. And, and I guess my questions will be a little bit twofold. One will be kind of more on the cash flow side of things as businesses prepare, but the other one is, is also on, you know, maybe what dollars could actually be coming in to help stimulus. So let's try on the cash flow front first, where it might not eliminate certain expenses or expenditures, but it might be might 
defer them. So to help with the current cash flow until uh, receivables and sales uh, start coming back in. So what have you heard from from the respective governments on maybe some deferral options out there? Uh, so so part of the, um, the federal uh, stimulus package that they announced, like 55 billion, I think, of the funds was really just a deferment of taxes for businesses and individuals. Um, so normally, uh, individuals have to file their t- their uh, pay their taxes by April 30th, uh, but now they'll be able to delay it until September 1st, uh, both federally and um, and provincially in Quebec. Uh, and the same will apply for their installments that will normally be due um, in June um, as well. So that will provide cash flow for any uh, entrepreneurs that are self-employed. Um, and on the business uh, front, um, if there are any taxes payable that were due after March 18th, so either uh, from a previous, from a current year filing or installments, they, they as well will be deferred um, until September 1st. So, for an example, if, uh, if a business happens to have a March 31st year end and its taxes are due a couple of months later, you'll actually have the extra couple of months to. Uh, hopefully, you've been profitable, by the way, and you owe taxes, but but you'd have that extra couple of months to kind of ride out the wave. Correct. Exactly. And the thing is, like you're saying, is it's it's only a deferment if there's actual profit. In situations where people are breaking even or, or really um, losing money, uh, there's really it wouldn't make a difference because they wouldn't be subject to making those payments. Uh, where, whereas the other measure that they did announce was an actual subsidy. So it's not based on whether or not there's a profit, really. So it's um, more than just a uh, uh, cash flow um, advantage. It's really putting, uh, reducing the cost of doing business for, for employers, which is the um, small business payroll tax credit, uh, which is equal to 10% of gross wages for a period of three months, uh, again, after March 18th. Um, the companies that are eligible for this are nonprofit or charitable organizations or uh, Canadian privately held companies um, with taxable capital of less than 15 million. So it's not going to be a huge amount, uh, amount of people that are, that are considered, but it will be for the smallest of companies that will be able to um, potentially keep more of their employees on payroll during this tough time. Is there a maximum per employee or how much an employer can get during this under this program? Correct. So the maximum is approximately is 1375 per employee. Um, the total per employer is 25,000. So the, it's roughly around the 18 employees at the maximum. And just if you work it back, so this is on, um, it's only for a period of three months, it ends up working out to an annual salary of around 55,000 before um, you reach the limit. Now, what if you're part of an associated group? So if you have companies that are, you have like a company, a building company, an operating company, uh, you know, and, but you're all really owned by the same people. Is it for the group or per company? So the, the thing is, it's not yet law yet. So um, parliament's um, reconvening again tomorrow. So we're all kind of a bit anxious to see the, the actual law before um, making any announcement, but based on something that was issued um Friday at uh, at nine o'clock by CRA, as they did indicate that it was per employer. So even if you have multiple stores or multiple different businesses that are in separate entities, it is um, a per uh, a payer. Or maybe they just haven't gotten to it yet. To be determined, of course. Correct. Now, is this something that you're supposed to calculate yourself and withhold or or not send in? Do you, is there any documentation or wording on how it functions? So they've actually specifically listed that there's not going to be a specific form or, or filing that's required. Uh, it's really going to have to get calculated manually by the employer. Um, and, and it's going to, the way to actually get it. So from a cash flow point of view is that they won't be sending in checks. It's just uh, the amount that you have to send in to the federal government when your um, wage remittances are due, which is usually the 15th of every month for, for most employers, uh, you'll just be able to reduce it from the uh, federal income tax withholdings that you have on your staff. It could now, be sometimes that the amount that people get withheld are less than 10% of the credit. So um, it might mean that this credit can actually only um, actually be received over, over several pay periods. Um, but even after the three months period, you can still continue to, to um, reduce the, the payments. 
Now, a lot of small businesses, Pete, as we know, they're the, the shareholders, they have family members in the business, they, you know, they have as many people within their entourage as possible. Are there any restrictions on whether shareholders are also employees or if there's, you know, ne- nephews and nieces and, and everybody work, actually working in the business on payroll? Correct. Um, so th- this is another situation where the, the devil will be in the details when the law comes out. Um, I did uh, see um, a reporter in the Global Mail specifically uh, state that uh, there would not be any exclusions for shareholders or family members. So I imagine this person must have had some kind of discussion with somebody at finance or at CRA. Um, so basically, for now, it, it appears that it, that, it, um, that, it, that there's no exclusions. But we'll have to wait and see. Any other measures that you that you see or have heard, or, or maybe I know it's again a fluid situation that's coming through the grapevine. Anything else that's coming in, or or maybe something that that entrepreneurs need to look at as far as you know, you have your year end coming up. Uh, you know, say your year end was is March, and you have a lot of these effects happening after your year end. Is there anything that can get accrued in the year that that would be okay from a tax standpoint? I think the only thing that um that I can really think of is that there might be some uh, valuations of, um, of, of inventory or, um, or receivables or other types of types of balance sheet items that you'll have to paying attention a bit more really, because there could be a realization. Uh, there could be a, a loss that would, that would get, that could get realized within that year that would help your cash flow. I think it's going to be important for everybody to stay yeah, continue staying um, focusing on what new announcements get made because there are these similar subsidies uh, in in places in Europe are, are are much higher than 10% really like we're seeing or sometimes just to take some of the load off of the unemployment uh, departments where the governments will sim- will subsidize up to 70 and 80% like we've seen that I think in the UK so who knows if, if similar measures will, will be taken here in, in Canada. Peter Moretta's tax partner at FL with details on some uh, support for businesses. Thanks so much, Peter. Thank you. Today's Entrepreneur, a special remote edition brought to you as usual by FL Montreal. Dan Delmar and Josh Miller with you this evening. I am at TNKR's home base. Josh, you are in a bunker in the West Island somewhere. Exactly. So we are going to move on and talk about human resources and how to do just this, managing resources remotely. And joining us uh, is Alida Eid. She's an HR advisor with PVisio by FL Montreal. Alida, welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, Alida, I, you know, we, we've been dealing with this. You've been dealing with, with uh, human interactions and, and employees for many, many years. Um, I know there's lots of do's and don'ts. We want to get to the cr- concrete things and actions for entrepreneurs and owners to take. But there's got to be a ton of emotions and feelings running rampant throughout every single business. Maybe you just want to kind of start there and, and give a, a quick kind of one-liner of, of what you see or what you hear people feeling from their anxiety levels and so forth. Um, yes, currently what, what we've been seeing is a lot of concern and insecurity towards, uh, well, mainly the virus and getting sick from the virus. Um, a lot of people are also scared of getting someone else sick from their family, um, older parents. And the insecurity, which uh, with uh, how long will this last? What's going to happen with our jobs? What's going to happen with our employer? So those are the type of questions um, that that employees are questioning themselves or feeling. So naturally, it comes with a lot of communication. And really, the communication does have to come from the top because you don't want the employees to drive the message. It's really the, the, the owners, the entrepreneurs that should drive it. That being said, you know, it's not exactly an everyday situation that we're in. So maybe what are the, some of the do's and don'ts of communicating with, with your entire team? Um, you can start with either one, do's or don'ts. But Alita, what are some of the things and how should employers and entrepreneurs communicate? Yeah, I do have a lot of uh, tips on the do's um, for employers, leaders, and frontline managers. But you're right; um, the communication is uh, communication is key, and from upper management, it has to happen on a daily basis. So, really informing employees of the steps uh, that you're taking to manage the situation, and taking the opportunity also in your communications um, to address their concerns with uh, the answers that you have available, obviously. But for everyone, um, 
in your communication, you have to show empathy, uh, remain authentic, um, and also give the opportunity to, to, to employees to express how they're doing and what they're feeling. So whether it's by chat, video call, phone calls, or survey surveys, so it gives them a sense of unity and security. Um, during your discussion with employees, I, uh, I would say solicit their opinion because sometimes they're going to raise points or ideas that could be in your blind spot at the moment. Um, and if you don't have the answers, it's totally okay. You can even be very uh, transparent about the fact that you're looking into resolving some of the issues or trying to find solutions at the moment. We're all adapting. Even leaders are adapting and don't have the answers. So that's fine. I guess it's also, you know, it also depends on the size of business that you're in. I mean, it's one thing if you're five people and you can really address people on a personal nature. If you're 205 people uh, or even maybe as, as, as little as 55 people, there's, it, it's not necessarily as easily said or as easily communicated and you still want to get the same message across. So I, I guess, are there other ways or, or maybe you kind of have to spread the leadership throughout and you have yeah. to make sure that several people can talk. Absolutely. That's that's exactly um, how you should do it. If you're a bigger company, um, maybe the top management um, can spread the word to the other level of managers. And then the, the communication has to basically come from the top and then it's it's basically the the tone and the message has to be the same up to uh, front uh, frontline managers. So everyone should be delivering the the same message with the same authenticity. I would say. Are there any don'ts like things that that leaders or managers or entrepreneurs should not do? Yes, um, don't. Well, for, especially for upper management, don't show signs of um, of you panicking. Whether it's uh, in your communication, your tone, or um, you know, if you feel that you're you're not in control of everything, consult and use resources first before interacting with uh, with employees or with managers. If you're a big a bigger company, um, don't focus on the negative information don't focus a lot on the negative information that's in the on the news and uh, don't downplay or minimize the situation just because you think maybe it could ease um, the panic um, another thing I would say is don't ignore employee reactions and don't stay rigid oh, sorry don't stay rigid in your expectations you have to be flexible at the moment. No, and there's, I mean, there's so much going on and so much information. I mean, even today with Legault's announcement at one saying, yes. you know, businesses have to close tomorrow night at yes. midnight. Yeah, mm -hmm. leaders have to be ready. They have to, they have to move. And, and I suspect it's, it's okay not to have all the answers at once. It's okay not to wait for the perfect level of communication because if you were going to wait for that, you would take forever to actually get a message out. Absolutely, yeah, 100%. Now, Coming back to that and saying, okay, businesses can close, but the reality is if you can work remotely uh, and you can maintain some aspect of the business, so then that's okay. So we're seeing an unprecedented number of people working from home. Managers or people managing those people and leaders don't necessarily, they're, not, they're just not used to it. So what are the things that you're seeing or what can, what can those leaders, what can those entrepreneurs do to help them manage their remote, remote workers? Yeah. So one thing that I've, uh, well, we're, I think we're all noticing is the fact that we've been, a lot of companies have been forced to, to come up with, uh, to, to come up and create a work from home policy or a flex time policy. Um, something that has been a necessity uh, for, for a while now, but we're kind of uh, forced right now to put it in place. So a few tips for, for, for the managers, something that can really, really help you with uh, managing remote teams would be uh, to get familiar and take advantage, of, uh, take advantage of the technology that's out there. So there's a lot of platforms and softwares that could be, um, that, that allow you to work virtually, but as if you're at the office. So Slack, Skype, Google Hangouts, um, GoToMeeting. So those are tools that will keep you in constant communication, collaboration with your team members. And even uh, you can even be able to track projects and tasks and, and so much more with, with technology. Again, communication comes 
I mean, it's it's super important. So daily check-ins um, with your team to keep them engaged. Anything that you would do at the office, I would say, try to do it, vir- try to think about it um, while you're virtual because we tend to forget because there's a lack of human interaction and, and, and connection. So if you think about it, if you put it in your calendar, one-on-ones, uh, team, team meetings, um, weekly updates to discuss feedback, uh, realign tasks, and we highly recommend also the face-to-face video that to keep the connection uh, going. And uh, my last two points would be for tips. They're very, very important. So define your expectations. Obviously, your expectations have for sure changed. Uh, you have no choice but to, to change them. So, But be clear with your team as to what are the projects, um, the deadlines, and don't necessarily... Uh, micromanage in the sense that are you online between eight and five? I, I'm, I'm sure they're managing kids, they're managing families at, at the moment. So as long as the work is done, I would say trust your team. Excellent. Thank you very much, Alita. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Today's Entrepreneur on CJAD 800, a remote edition, inspiring stories from outstanding business people, Dan Delmar and Josh Miller with you, presented as always by FL Montreal. And as we are in a very strange situation, so we're broadcasting remotely again this evening as we did last week. And finally for the evening, we're going to talk about banking, something that Josh is uh, really of concern to pretty much everyone, but for businesses in particular, uh, you need a good relationship with your banker. And uh, we'll bring in Patrick Sullivan, partner at FL, to explain how you can uh, keep that relationship relationship going well in a crisis. Patrick, welcome back. Always a pleasure. And Dan, you're you're so right. I mean, the, the biggest question mark is, well, if I have no sales and my receivables aren't coming in, how am I going to pay the bills? And if I'm really, if I owe money to the bank, then then what's going to happen? So I do I do have a ton of questions that just roll right through my head. But I guess the the, the first one that comes to mind, Patrick, is, you know, how how open should the entrepreneur be with his or her banker? You know, is it is it a time to say, you know what, only only show the best or do you show like the really the worst situation? What's what's the best? Because hopefully the banker wants to work with you, but it's really a two way street. So what do you what do you feel in that respect? And, and what are you kind of seeing, seeing and hearing on the street? Uh, obviously, bankers like to stay informed of any kind of situation. Now we're dealing with a crisis situation. So I would tend to say that honesty is the key factor. I mean, speak to your banker, keep him appraised of the situation. Uh, don't try to hide stuff. Be upfront, and uh, they're there to help. They're not there to foreclose. They're there to help at this time. Now, no question that that's, you know, it's, it's probably in their best interest to help versus foreclose because you don't know what you're really going to realize on those assets. But when they're when they're asking for information, they're probably asking for updated budgets or projections. They're probably asking for you know what do you expect over the next few weeks or or however long. It, it's it's almost impossible to give. So what do you do? Do you give them a budget and change it every week? Um, what, what 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 do you suggest? Well, it, it, it's pretty difficult to forecast or prepare budgets at in in these days and times. I mean, we have to live with the situation. It's an ongoing situation. So variables change hourly. I can can even go as far as that. So yes, it's a good idea to provide your banker with information, especially pertaining to what is happening now, what's going to happen a week from now, two weeks from now. I would not say to provide a banker uh, with a budget that that will outlook 12 months down the road because we don't know how long this crisis is going to last and we definitely don't know how the business is going to react afterwards i mean is it going to be uh is is it going to be booming is it is it going to stay flatline for a while and then just slowly gradually pick up what are going to be the costs related to the startups because obviously when you stop operating a business there are startup costs. I mean, you stop the machinery, you send everybody home. Sometimes there's a lag and it involves obviously monies to restart the engine. Uh, So I would tend to say that bankers have to be kept appraised, but on an ongoing basis, not strictly provide them with projections that basically nobody knows when the economy is gonna start picking up again. 
But if they're going to provide them, do you do you just basically put it on a pessimistic basis at this standpoint because the worst could happen? Well, I think bankers are are, are human beings. I mean, they're not they're not there to say uh, is it a pessimistic uh, budget? Is it a, a you know a realistic one? I think you have to go based on the knowledge that you have at this current time, and that's why I say it's a moving target. Uh, you're going to have to react on an ongoing basis with your banker. Obviously, when everything is stopped, yes, I agree with you, receivables don't necessarily come in and expeditions don't necessarily go out. I mean, everything is at standstill. And, and, and today, Mr. Legault announced that everything is basically shut down uh, for the next uh, few weeks. So nothing really is going to happen. If there's nobody at the payables, nobody's going to get a check. And if there's nobody at the receivables, nobody's going to be there to collect money. So bankers are aware of this. And that's why there's been uh, various programs that have been implemented either by the provincial government and or the federal government to help support these businesses uh, and obviously, hopefully, uh, restart uh, promptly. What are you hearing from what the banks or financial institutions are offering? Are you hearing a little more easing? Are you hearing a little more extra, like whether it's banks, whether it's BDC, EDC, Investissement Quebec? What are you, what are you hearing out there that, maybe businesses should look into or take advantage of as early as it is, because I know things constantly moving. Well, the, there's various programs that, that have been put into place, either through Investissement Quebec, uh, who are offering funding amounts, a uh, minimum 50 grand to small businesses to help their cash flow. Uh, the federal government put in a program with BDC uh, up to $2 million with flexible terms, six months uh, postponement of payments for qualifying businesses. Obviously, each case is a case-by-case. Case. Uh, bankers are the front line for these funds that will be made available either through the provincial or the federal uh, government. So you have to deal with your banker. Obviously, let's not kid ourselves. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of small businesses out there that were already in financial difficulties. Now, these programs aren't designed to help companies that had no future. The programs are designed to help companies that do have a future and that just have to go through this crisis. Do you think that the companies that were experiencing some financial difficulty earlier are going to be able to hide behind this crisis and hopefully emerge, hopefully make some changes. But, you know, could they hide behind this crisis uh, in, in trying to fix themselves? Well, I wish I had a crystal ball to answer that one. Uh, obviously, <laughs> there will be uh, certain entrepreneurs that will try to hide behind this. Now, they're getting relieved in many different ways. Either it be through uh, their lease agreements that are deferred. Uh, so, yeah, there, there may be an influx of unexpected cash flow but you have to understand that if the business was failing before it doesn't make that it's not going to be failing after patrick sullivan partner at fl montreal and trustee about being proactive with your banker thanks so much patrick A pleasure and josh last week on the show you were absent unfortunately mike newton was in and uh, i asked mike at the end what is your one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur in a crisis so i want to ask you the same thing because um it's been a difficult couple of weeks for a lot of entrepreneurs and hey we could use uh, all the wisdom we can get so what do you think what's your best advice for uh for these panicky times i think that uh, my, my one or two pieces of advice uh, certainly for the leaders and entrepreneurs out there is and especially because we're in such a fluid situation don't wait for anything to be perfect. You really just got to try and keep informing your people. Your people are, at the moment, your, your largest and your biggest asset. So keep them informed. Keep them informed with real news, not fake news. Don't wait for a perfect moment because if you wait three hours to tell them something because you've been accumulating information, that's three hours longer that they've had to figure out or worry about what's coming next. So be a leader, communicate effectively and properly and on a very timely basis. And this way, you can control the message at least as much as possible. And you can head over to todaysentrepreneur.org to uh, listen to a decade worth of entrepreneur profiles there. Thanks very much uh, to all our guests this evening, and we'll talk to you soon. Have a good night. This has been a production of TNKR Media. Good time.
Talk.